Aloha, everyone. My name is Rob Hack. I'm from the Hawaii Pacific Export Council, and we have the great pleasure and privilege to put on a series of webinars and perform one-on-one -on -one company mentoring regarding exporting. And we're able to do that through a generous grant we received from DBET, uh, who in turn receives a grant from SBA in Washington, DC. So I'd like to thank uh, both DBET and SBA for this opportunity. Our talk today, as you know, is on logistics and that essentially is shipping and moving product from Hawaii to foreign markets. And just to be pedantic and clear about it, when we're talking about exporting, we're talking about sending it to a foreign country, our products and services, not to a neighbor island, not to the mainland, uh, not even to Guam or the Northern Marianas, which are US territories, but we're talking about completely foreign countries like uh, most of our Hawaii companies are very interested in Japan. Uh, we, the United States has a free trade agreement with Mexico and Canada, and certainly Europe, South America, um, et cetera. But most of our companies in Hawaii tend to gravitate towards the Asian market, and um, we'll tend to discuss that today in this talk. Uh, but the lessons learned here um, today can be translated to other markets, whether it's Europe or Latin America or wherever you're particularly interested in. So um, I mentioned that we are the Hawaii Pacific Export Council, often called HPEC for short. We're a, a nonprofit uh, in Honolulu. We're one of 61 district export councils in the United States and uh, a district export council is set up by the Department of Commerce. And our board members are all nominated by uh, the Commerce Secretary. And uh, on our board, we have people from uh, uh, all kinds of backgrounds, but one common denominator is that everybody has a long, uh, extensive uh, career in, in some topic in exporting. So our speaker today, who we'll get to in just a few minutes, is Brian Suzuki. He's previously on the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. And um, I bring this up because on our YouTube channel, uh, our archive of these events, uh, we have approaching 100 videos now. And I encourage you to go to YouTube and look for the Hawaii Pacific Export Council, and you'll be able to get uh, all of these videos at your leisure. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Jamie Lum. She's the international program manager at DBET and she can explain the Hawaii State Trade Expansion Program in more detail. Jamie. Mahalo Rob and good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us on this uh, for this session on logistics. Uh, thank you also to Brian Suzuki for being a part of this today. I appreciate him. Um, so I'm Jamie Lum. I'm with the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. And our department is the recipient, <clears throat> and we ad, uh, administer uh, a grant, as Rob already mentioned, from the SBA for what is called the State Trade Expansion Program, or in Hawaii, we've branded it as High Step, the Hawaii State Trade Expansion Program. Um, we do work with partner organizations such as HPEC. Um, such as the Small Business Development Centers, uh, the Women's Business Center, which in Hawaii is the Mink Center uh, for uh, Business and Leadership. Um, we work with uh, the Veterans Business Opportunity Center, um, our local SBA. Um, we work with John Holman, who is uh, with the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, he's the director here for the Pacific Asia. So we have many different partners that we work with to put this program together. Uh, High Step is an export development program. It's designed for companies um, that are new to export, that are just exploring it, uh, or all the way to companies that are already exporting and looking to expand. And, um, and thank you, Rob, for putting up our, uh, our website here so you can actually see the three components that we have under High Step, which is our export readiness, 
program are Hawaii Pavilions and the company assistance. So uh, what you're participating in today is part of our export readiness program. Um, uh, we engage HPEC to help us put together these uh, very informative webinars on various export related topics and also um, uh, sessions that address specific markets. So, you know, these are designed to help give companies information, um, especially for those that maybe know nothing about or very little about exporting. Um, Rob is scrolling through the, the, the topics that we've covered so far and what's coming up. So we usually have one a month. Um, and, uh, and as Rob said, uh, they are recorded and uh, they are in the which HPEC website as well as uh, you can go back and view these on the DBED website as, as well. And I think they go back as far as maybe 2017 on various topics. So that's one component of the export readiness. Uh, the other part is um, where we work closely with our partners to help um, give some uh, business consulting um, and export consulting um, help to companies that register for the high step program. So once a company uh, registers, we assign them to one of our, uh, one of our partner organizations uh, for at least one, uh, at least one one-on-one -on -one session. Um, and so uh, uh, this will help companies in, um, in putting together uh, an export strategy or um, maybe they have one already and maybe need to fine tune it. Uh, if they have particular uh, uh, issues that uh, their company is dealing with uh, export related. Um, they can try to um, also, people like Rob are very helpful um, in trying to pinpoint uh, other resources or particular uh, suggest some solutions. So uh, that's part of the export readiness. Um, so another component we have uh, are the Hawaii pavilions. Um, these are uh, trade shows that DBED has uh, selected for uh, to to organize um, to, to put together an organized fashion where we we take a group of companies and we exhibit together under the Hawaii banner. Uh, we also have a number of trade shows we're doing this year that uh, we're working with the Department of Agriculture. So together uh, we are attending um, and and trade shows are starting to open up. Um, actually, the trade shows in Japan the last two years. They've still been held, but um, companies, uh, it, it had to be limited to companies that already had some uh, agent or representative or importer in Japan. So um, we're, ho we're hoping as things open up um, that the people here, the company uh, personnel here in Hawaii will be able to go and we do anticipate that. But these are uh, the trade shows that we have um, on our calendar uh, for 2020 that uh, Rob is showing. Um, on the screen. And so we will recruit though uh, for those um, about six months or so before we'll send out a recruitment announcement and it's open to um, any company that has a Hawaii made product or, um, uh, or service um, to be able to be part of the, the pavilion. Um, the step funds are used to subsidize the majority of the cost and companies pay a small participation fee and as well as uh, cover their own uh, travel expenses, et cetera. Um, but we find that this is a powerful way to help Hawaii companies um, participate at, in these large trade shows at, a, at a, a cost that would be lower, uh, well below what they would spend if they went in um, on their own. Um, so that's one of the main things. And then again, um, to be part of the Hawaii brand um, and to um, be with other, uh, Hawaii companies and you know maybe even learn from each other. We find that happens a lot when these um, companies go to trade shows. They learn a lot from each other uh, through their individual exporting experiences. And then the final uh, piece is the company assistance. Uh, we currently have already uh, completed it for this year, but basically what that is is that companies can apply directly for funding to help support their uh, export um, plans, uh, activities that they have uh, planned out for uh, the, the year. Um, it can be uh, trade shows um, and they don't have to be the trade shows that um, uh, we have for our, we've designated as Hawaii Pavilions. In fact, we encourage companies to find other trade shows of 
outside of what you know DBED or Department of Ag is already doing. Uh, it can be used for uh, to help um, with things like if uh, you're interested in a gold key service, which is something that the U.S. Department of Commerce has to help companies. Um, in uh, provide services to them in the country that they're looking to export to. Uh, they can help set up uh, meetings, et cetera, with potential uh, partners, distributors, et cetera. Uh, it can be used for shipping sample products. If you have a buyer that um, you know doesn't wanna put in a full order, might want just some samples. Um, and then in the last two years, because of the limited uh, travel and because of uh, trade shows not, um, being conducted in person, um, SBA is allowing a lot more of these funds to be used for things like uh, e-commerce and digital marketing. So um, uh, high step funds can also be used to support that. So um, this is just a quick overview. If you go to our um, website here that uh, Rob has up, um, you can uh, take a look at that and get more information. Uh, we typically, just to let you know, because our funding, we receive it basically on the same cycle as a, as a federal fiscal year, which goes October through September. That's kind of um, the, the calendar of how we, we usually kick off the new year in October, November, when we find out we have funding, which we, we need to um, submit a, a new application for, <laughs> for 2023. Um, but we normally find out in September and then we start um, doing a kickoff and we start preparing for the next year. So just so that you um, understand kind of what the cycle is. Um, and if anybody is um, interested, um, you can go to the registration and submit a registration form. There's no cost, there's no obligation. We um, simply wanna get some information about your company um, and to see where you're at uh, in your um, sort of your export, um, uh, experience and uh, we'll go from there. So thank you for uh, again for joining us this morning. Thank you for um, uh, Rob and I'll turn it back to you. Thanks very much for um, your step program has been wonderful uh, and over the years we've interacted and mentored and educated uh, hundreds of companies in Hawaii um, with these funds and it's just been a fantastic program. So um, I mentioned earlier our uh, archive of videos here. And um, if you go back in, in time through the years, uh, looking at these, you will hear me and other people talking about um, logistics. And I, I bring this up because we have um, one of the, the top people in Hawaii as a speaker today is Brian Suzuki from Hawaii Air Cargo. But I like um, uh, when Brian speaks at our events because Brian is really a full service logistics provider. And if you were to go back and view some of my marketing uh, videos here where I'm talking about packaging and these types of things, I think you'll find how um, all of this relates to logistics and our Hawaii companies tend to think of the logistics and the shipping issue too late in the process. And they can wind up losing a lot of the margins on their international sales because they have not paid enough strict attention to the shipping. And that could mean that uh, your product might need to be chilled. Uh, there's many different aspects of this, but um, I think that if you uh, develop a relationship with a freight forwarder like Brian, you can get him to uh, consult to you on uh, what it is your, your product needs for shipping to these foreign markets. And with his experience on both sides of the equation, meaning in Hawaii and let's say in Japan, for example, he can save you a lot of money by uh, pointing things out to you that you will have never even thought about. So with that, I'd like to uh, reintroduce Brian Suzuki. He's the president of Hawaii Air Cargo, and I'm gonna start his slideshow now. Uh, Brian, can you see that? Yes, okay. I can see it. Please begin when you're ready. Okay, I'm ready, next slide. 
Sorry about that. Uh, I'm not very good for technical things, so I have to have Rob, uh, I guess, turn the page. Oh, so, no. so if you no can problem. go ahead, next, I'll say next slide. Next. Okay, these are some of the other things that we talk about uh, and I've had before with teaching methods of shipping. Uh, some people want to take a tour of what we're talking about at the airport, at the harbors, and then we had breakout sessions in the past. Uh, next slide. Okay, specifically today, I'm going to talk about the different methods of shipping. Uh, I We had a, a uh, you can continue next, uh, it'll start bringing in some things, but we had a uh, speaker uh, set up to speak about ocean freight, uh, but looks like she had an emergency surgery today. And because of that, she couldn't make it. Uh, but then she was eager to talk about uh, using Matson. She's in, uh, I'm talking about family, and she is a, uh, I guess, uh, working with Matson and she does the international side. So if you have any questions specifically about ocean freight, ask, uh, send me a message. You'll have my contact later, and then I can get uh, uh, Pam to get back to you regarding your ocean freight needs. Uh, next slide. We have ocean. Uh, next slide. And air is the next one. Go ahead. Okay. We have all kinds of methods, but when I say all kinds, we are limited to air or ocean. Okay. I won't explain all these additional things, but we will cover these things and what, you, what things that you should be asking of your freight forwarder or your shipping uh, specialist. Uh, next slide. All right, B, one of the things I think a company who's new to exporting will hear the term freight forwarder or FF very often. They'll see that in their documentation, but it, Perhaps they don't really know what is a freight forwarder. Can you explain sure. just very briefly what what that means? Okay, a freight forwarder, actually, they do everything like if you're an ocean freight forwarder uh, or an air freight forwarder, for instance, my company, we do everything that an airline requires, but we don't have our own planes. We use all the scheduled flights as, so, as well as a surface forwarder, ocean freight forwarder, we use the steamship companies that are available. Many of the airlines as uh, freight um, steamship companies, they don't want to do the detail. They don't want to do all the documentation that's required. They just want to have the ship brought to them. Uh, for instance, a freight forwarder has to go through all kinds of stuff like security checks, background checks of the uh, shipper so that we don't have any, but putting something that you don't want on an aircraft. Uh, that means also dangerous goods. We have to check on that. Things that might, uh, I guess, catch fire. Uh, we also have uh, bomb threats that uh, we have to always be aware of. So all of our employees on the air freight side, they have to be trained. Also, they have to be uh, vetted. So all employees <clears throat> cannot, uh, they have to be US citizens or naturalized or birth by birth. But uh, it is something that you never think about, except that if you're on an airplane flying, you know, you don't want anything bad happening. So we are one of the links that have to check all those things uh, out. And then we get tested. TSA tests us every so many months. They try to get something, a package into our system to get on the plane. Uh, and uh, we have to be able to watch for that. So you can't just say, I'm from XYZ company, like an IBM and I want to ship something, we have to go back to uh, the home office and find out if you really are a uh, employee of that company. So anyway, the, that's a freight forwarder does a lot of things that uh, an airline will say, we don't have the time to do it, uh, therefore go to a freight forwarder. And um, as a matter of fact, because of that, about 30 years ago, I formed the Air Freight Association of Hawaii, the Air Cargo Association of Hawaii. And we've been in existence since then. And we've done a lot of things to help the shipping public. Uh, because when you have it by ocean freight, you have to have out of Hawaii, whether it's going domestic or international, you have to have full container loads. And unfortunately, we don't have a surface forwarder that'll take less than a container and build a container uh, because it, you don't have enough people shipping all the time. Therefore, 
Uh, it's minimal unless you have a company that ships a full 40 foot container in the refrigerator. And I'll, I'll tell you some stories later. But let's go on as, as far as answering Rob's question on who's a, what's a freight forwarder. We got that in a nutshell. Yes. Okay, again, methods of shipping. This is the air side now. I'm going, we ship uh, passenger flights. Uh, we have all air, uh, all cargo aircraft. Uh, you can use a freight forwarder, integrator of people like FedEx, UPS. Uh, the post office is another one, but next slide. You can see the breakdown. Now, these are air containers. They have all kinds of sizes. And uh, the M1 that's showing there, or the P1P, uh, it's quite large. And uh, you, you see how these go on. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Most of the freight goes on the bellies of a passenger flight. Uh, and norm, uh, what we see a wide body, uh, something that uh, it's like a 747, uh, the Airbus, and all these other uh, big uh, 787s, uh, things like that. Uh, they use a belly where they put their baggage as well as cargo. And we use that for a lot of flights. Unfortunately, during this COVID time, we just don't have uh, that many wide body flights. For instance, to Japan, prior to back in 2019, before COVID, we've had we had 21 daily flights to Japan, different uh, airports, of course, 21 daily. Today we have zero daily, and then, um, but we have some carriers that are flying, but most of those carriers from Japan or Japan to Hawaii or from, um, well, not necessarily Korean, Korean Airlines hasn't started, but those that are coming from Asia are carrying mainly cargo because of the backlog on the West Coast ports. Uh, a lot more air cargo is coming in. So not much passenger, if at all, but mostly uh, cargo, they're full of cargo. But going back now, they're going back empty. We don't have anything to send back. So next slide. Go ahead. These are the insides of a uh, cargo aircraft only, no passengers. So it's got a lot of room, but uh, we use Pacific Air Cargo daily for our consolidation coming in from the mainland uh, to Hawaii. Uh, as far as going to uh, Asia, we have to use people like FedEx's plane or UPS's flight, but they go back to the mainland and they go around to Anchorage and then on to Asia. And so it might not be right away. It might take uh, three days to get to Asia by air. It's a lot faster than going by boat. And, um, Okay, next slide. Uh, Rob, next slide, please. Did I lose you? I'm not catching. Oh, we lost that slide. Looks like I lost you, Rob. Hi, Rob. I lost you and I'm missing the slideshow. Hello.
Hi, everyone. <clears throat> um, I'm sure Rob must be experiencing some connection problems. So if we can just give him a minute or so to get that resolved. So sorry. Oh, well, there he is. Sorry, Brian. Oh, there we no, go. I, I can yeah. hear you. So yeah, we'll just let him get back up. All right. So, interesting how I can talk to you, but I guess it must be on Rob's end because I'm, I'm missing my slideshow and as well as the vocal. He's in Kentucky, by the way, oh. attending the conference there. <laughs> That's amazing with Zoom. Yeah, there we go. Thanks, Rob. Rob, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear oh, you. You're back up. Yep, okay. please, please proceed. All right, next slide. Okay, the integrated carriers are your FedEx and UPS. Next slide. Um, I'm going to mention that uh, the air freight is not regulated at all in the US. Therefore, you have to shop around. It's a, I wouldn't say buyer beware, but actually there are a lot of tricks in the trade and I'll show you some of the tricks that some companies use. Because of deregulations, uh, you might just hear and tell you a story. Somebody heard that, oh, Brian, I don't want to talk to you because I'm getting 50 cents a pound from here and there. And then they said, I said, there's nobody going to be able to sell you 50 cents a pound. It's too low, you know, below my cost. What happened is that uh, once I audited the bill, this lady was shipping, um, she only had three, four shipments uh, in one month. And in that four shipments had they used my company, which at that time was, uh, I think about $1.90 a pound versus what she said was 50 cents. I, I would have saved her $4,500 on that four shipments. And she said, how can that be? And I explained to her, that uh, some of the things, and I'll explain to you how that happens. Uh, next slide. Okay. Shipments are direct. Coming in from check carriers for different rates, and therefore I'm saying it's directional. Okay, keep this slide on. I'll go back. Back, back. Of the slide. You gotta. Okay, I'm missing that slide. Okay. And these are just basically some things that you must know, and don't forget people charge people meaning. The air freight, uh, they charge by actual weight or dimensional weight, whichever is greater. And then the density of cargo is a factor to get so much. Uh, <clears throat> okay, this is important for dimensional weight. Uh, different people use different uh, formulas. And uh, for international, we use length times width times height per piece divided by 194. Um, I'm sorry, the uh, international is 166. And uh, the answer, if that's more than your actual weight, then you charge for that weight. Whereas uh, people like FedEx and UPS, they don't use 166, they use 139. And uh, I've had the I've found, uh, the person that I was mentioning about have paid a lot, even though they got a cheap price per pound, 
their cargo had to be, it was, uh, I would say, balloon freight, a lot of space it took up. And that company, it's a national company, was using 94. Uh, and domestically, we used 194. But this one was a domestic shipment, and we used 94. And so 94 goes in any connector much more on twice as much as uh, 194. So the person was paying for more uh, chargeable weight than my, my rate. And then because of that, she had a you know huge amount of uh, price. And the price that she was given only included the air freight. It didn't include pickup, delivery, fuel surcharge. And as I mentioned today, fuel charge, surcharge is really going uh, uh, crazy uh, because of the oil changes, uh, oil price. But uh, fuel surcharge is huge. Next slide. I'm going to be going through this. Inco terms is very important because of how you deal with your customer. For instance, <clears throat> the term what is, uh, might include buying the product and having it shipped all the way to the door of the customer. And that's a little bit high because the in, inland or uh, you know, to the foreign country, it's better for that company to use their own freight for uh, own customs broker and that customs broker's uh, uh, trucking company. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, you have to make sure that when you uh, do these contracts, uh, for instance, if you take it, all the contract would say to the carrier, in other words, to the airline or freight forwarder. And then after that, the responsibility is with the buyer. Therefore, anything that happens in route goes to the buyer's responsibility, any claims they have to file. On the other hand, if they have it all the way to the airport, then you as a shipper will be responsible to get it there intact and in one piece and in good shape. So things that this is very important. On, on your terms that you uh, work the contract with the customer. Next slide. Sorry, Brian, I'd like to interrupt and stay on this point for a second. Oh, sure. Many of our new exporters have not dealt with INCO terms yes. and what these mean. And they, they get updated every few years. Um, there was a- I think Oh, there was this, one in 2020. I think yeah, so. there, there was an, an update in 2020. And I would strongly recommend that our new exporters look into this and research it. You can find at trade.gov uh, and some other websites can explain the different INCO terms very clearly. But I think if you focus on XWorks, FOB, and CIF, those are the three that I see the most. Occasionally, a customer will ask you for a price for DDP. And that can be very complicated for you to figure out what are the customs uh, going into Japan, for example. Um, uh, but anyway, you could be asked for that. But again, just, just understand XWorks is the easiest for you. DDP is the most complicated for you. And then all of these other ones are sort of a variation in between. And it really is a transference of risk and uh, who's doing what along the way. But I, 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 again, I highly recommend everybody spend a little time in learning about these inco terms. Sorry, uh, Brian. No, no problem. I've, I've never had DDP except for inbound shipments. I, I get a lot of um, requests to quote for customs clearance and delivery. And, uh, you know, so they give us all the particulars and we have to go back with our charges. Are they going to charge the uh, shipper, uh, where everything is paid for uh, by the shipper's end. So, okay, next slide. Okay, there are so many charges that uh, people will charge for. Um, shipper's export declaration, invoice, you have to have a packing list. Uh, this is to ease customs clearance. Pick up and deliver charges, look for that. There's some people that charge handling fees. Uh, Customs clearance fees, that's uh, something else that would tack on, but that depends on the terms of your contract. Usually, if somebody's going to go and uh, do their own clearance, your customer, that is, that's fine. Agriculture inspection fees, we will do that. They may ask you that um, if you're shipping something that uh, might get rejected, you may have to put in a guarantee that if you do, you'll resend another shipment, things like that. We are doing a lot of 
uh, potted plants and uh, cut flowers in the past. Uh, we haven't been doing that at all uh, lately. Um, airport fees, some airport charge for different things. To give you an example, in, in I think it's Tokyo only, uh, not Osaka or uh, Nagoya, but if we ship the shipment of say 100 boxes, what we do is we put, we shrink wrap the box on a pallet and then we say it's one piece at, said to contain 100 boxes. And we'll put that on the air window because the airport fees include per piece. So if the air, air bill costs one piece, even though it's got 100 boxes, they'll charge you one fee, which is only $2. But if you have it separately at 100, they'll charge you $200 uh, as a, just to handle the, the boxes. And that's what uh, some of those fees may include. Of course, duty, that usually goes to the uh, buyer uh, and uh, taxes as well. And uh, don't forget pounds versus kilo are very important. So be aware that when you talk to somebody that they charge you per pound as, as opposed to per kilo, you might think it's per kilo, but then it might not be. So uh, make sure you're, you're aware of that. Next. Okay, I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit. Uh, this working was a, a big uh, ship into Asia and to, um, we're having some issues right now because of the collection. And uh, we're shipping them to uh, all around the United States to um, uh, pet shops in, in Asia, as well as to Europe, all these uh, live tropical fish. Next slide. This story, a buyer from Japan came in and wanted to buy a uh, small, you know, in Japan, for instance, they have uh, a little altar that they put flowers in and you know, they, they keep up if it gets dry or it dies out, they put new ones. So the buyer wanted to have three anthuriums, small, medium size, and then they would want two pieces of uh, leaf for the anthuriums. So I took them over to the big island, which is at, uh, Greenpoint Nursery, and they liked the flowers, they liked the, and the price came out reasonable, and with the shipping, it was reasonable. Then finally, they, they went back, talked to the people, they come back, and they want 10,000 bouquets per week. And I'm going, 10,000, nobody could supply that. And I said, how, can, how why do you folks want to order that much? He says, well, we're in the 7-Eleven of Japan, uh, and the 7-Eleven store, so if we, we have a hundred and 90 stores in Tokyo alone. We can't just separate it, so we had to get everybody. Well, that killed the whole deal since nobody could get that many bouquets uh, ready at one time. Uh, next slide. So there are interesting stories. Now, we talked, Jamie talked about going to these uh, different shows. Now, this is uh, the China Hotel and Food Expo in Beijing, China. As a matter of fact, for those of you, this is really important if you're interested uh, in doing anything. And uh, the slide uh, above is the French Gourmet. They're shipping, or we were shipping for them to Asia in boxes with dry ice to bakeries and hotels. And um, the beauty of the whole thing is that they prepare the dough, they flash freeze it. The buyer, when he gets there, all they have to do is uh, they can put it in the freezer until they need whatever boxes they want and then take it out. And these are pastries like bear claws and you know, all the kind of really nice stuff. And it tastes really good. They thaw it, then they uh, bake it and they go ahead and you know, uh, sell it as though they made it, but there's no waste. And because of that, uh, the stories on that show, I end up working with DBED and Department of Ag and they pay me to move all the products for the show. And um, what happened was we took all the frozen dough, it was frozen, and we had it in the exhibit hall uh, in a the freezer. Then Sunday, the day before the opening of the uh, show, I took a hand truck and I was taking it to a joining hotel that they made an arrangement to bake their uh, frozen dough. And so as I was leaving, uh, trying to get it across to the, the hotel, it's adjoining. They, the security guard stopped me, brought an English speaking person and said, you can't take anything out of this place. This is a foreign trade zone. So anything that came in or everything that came in has not cleared customs or ag. 
so you can't take anything out. And so that really like chilled this whole thing. It was very dramatic. The vice president there and the lady is from Hong Kong. They wanted a translator and, um, uh, and they got her to meet at Beijing. So at any rate, dejectedly, we went back to the US pavilion, which was the fourth floor of this huge uh, convention hall. And um, dejectedly, you know, walking back, what are we going to do? And then I noticed there was a guy, a, a booth selling pizza ovens. And there, you know, the flat ovens. And uh, I stopped and I said, can that work? And he says, yeah, we just need propane, and then, uh, which is easy to get. And we just need something to bake. I said, I got something to bake. And so the vice president talked to them what kind of stuff they needed to do. And they got, uh, the other people got the propane. Next morning, seven o'clock in the morning, we're there to set up. The show doesn't open at night. And this aroma permeated the whole convention center of fresh, freshly baked pastries. And our nose took us back up to the fourth floor and then went to the oven site. And the thing was working. They tried it out. The pastries was terrific. And uh, when the show started, everyone was coming up to ask where the smell was coming from, the aroma. They had to write on the back of a cardboard box with a uh, marking pen, uh, magic marker. For samples, they had an arrow, go to Hawaii booth. And we had, and the Hawaii booth was the one that you show on the bottom left. And that was for Hawaiian Candy's uh, Midland and Mac label. And uh, to end that story with that, uh, we were the hit, we mean the Hawaii booth and the French company was a hit for the show. And uh, the organizers came up to us and said, next year is in Shanghai. We want you there. Uh, you tell us where you want your booth. We give you anything you want because that was the most popular thing. It was a three-day affair. And uh, this company was working in Honolulu, downtown Honolulu, the Fall Street Mall. They were in the basement of a building. It's the coolest place you can find. Uh, and uh, right after that, they started to get orders. They hired that gal to become their rep in Hong Kong. And they decided to use Hong Kong as a distribution center. So they built a first class um, bakery um, to, uh, to do things to make the dough. And right away from the making it, flash freezing it, put it right into the 40 foot mass and containers and took it out to uh, Hong Kong. And uh, so at any rate, they were so popular. Five years after that, they moved to uh, the mainland because the shipping costs from Los Angeles to Hong Kong was a lot, lot less, several thousand dollars less than from Honolulu to uh, that area. So they moved away and I lost my customer, but then they succeeded. So that was a great show and it was lucky to happen like that. Uh, next slide. Brian, um, you mentioned to me recently that even though we had a pandemic last year, your shipments to Japan were a record for you for Hawaii Air Cargo. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, yes, I, it's strange. I guess because we ship Hawaii products from jams and jellies, honey, coffee. We're shipping uh, cookies, candy, of course. Uh, not as much as before, but uh, the slide is of Hawaii Host, uh, their booth, they were there. And uh, the thing is that, uh, I don't know what it was, they started to order and we have like every three weeks we'll have a big shipment. But now from April, actually, actually we started two weeks ago, uh, we started again and this started last year. Biggest single product that we're shipping is Hawaiian sandals, slippers and sandals. And uh, as fast as they can manufacture it, we're shipping. And we're shipping thousands of uh, every week, thousands of slippers and sandals each week. And they come up to a huge pallets, like six pallets uh, of uh, these things. And that, whoever they got, I don't know who the customer in Japan was but, uh, or is, the thing is that they, they must be distributing the slippers and sandals throughout Japan. And the people, because now it's not so warm a month, they can't uh, keep it in stock. So every week they're shipping uh, slippers and sandals. So that was the biggest increase. But, now, we're also shipping a lot more cookies. We don't ship as much uh, papayas and pineapple as we used to. Uh, the thing is, by the way, 
pineapple, for instance, they get their pineapples from the uh, Philippines. And there's a huge difference. We're shipping Maui pine. And the Maui pine was really sweet. So it was important for them to do a taste. In other words, you have to try to tell the buyer to make sure people taste it. Because once you taste it, it's not like a regular pineapple. And, and sure enough, we did a lot of that at some of the shows in Japan, have them taste it. My hotel room was always a place where we had to cut up all the pineapples and refrigerate them. Uh, actually, I took it to the venue's uh, refrigeration. But uh, we're cutting up, uh, had to go to the day, their 7-Eleven or their 99 cents, so I, uh, 100 yen store, they call that, and buy knives and cutting boards. But uh, things like that, we make do. That's why I say that if you have any product, you should go in advance to see one of those shows to see if you really can fit in. Uh, next slide. The other thing is to have it in the language of where you're going to. If it's Japan, have it in Japanese. Today, the DBED hires someone to provide a, a translator at the booth. So they have all that kind of stuff there. This is a story about uh, uh, that, that last one was a slide about uh, uh, plants. We had a bunch of uh, uh, Japanese men, about four of them, came to Hawaii. This is in, in the year 2000. And uh, you can put the next slide on. And uh, these people went directly to, well, by the way, Neil Ar that's Neil Arkaki. And then uh, he, that those are the translators that are hired to, uh, you know, interpret for them at the show. Uh, and uh, I think this was at the, the China show. Okay, this slide, uh, they came to the Department of Ag, the four people, they went there. Uh, and they were here on a golf outing with the travel agent because they were, they, they were officers or owners of this park, the Pineapple Park in Okinawa. But it was just pineapples up to that time. And the, you know, rows and rows, you drive through, and you see one, you see them all. But they wanted to have plants that were part of the pineapple, or they call it ananas, a scientific name, uh, family. And they heard that uh, Hawaii had some. Just by chance, uh, when they went to the Papa Vang, they couldn't speak English and nobody there could speak Japanese. So right away, I, I knew the people from all the experience of traveling, you know, showing Hawaii aquatic plants and things like that. They called me up and I was there 20 minutes later and then found out that what they wanted, they wanted to find these uh, plants. So I said, just by chance, I know a personal friend of mine who's the, uh, I guess, the world's foremost hybridizers of these plants. So I took them uh, the next day, we took a flight to Hilo, went to see the nursery, and uh, right away they wanted like 5,000 plants. Now, to take plants from Japan had to be no roots, no soil, no bugs, of course. So there was a preparation time of uh, taking the keikis, we call it the shoots that come down, because the shoots of these plants, they just stick them in the ground and roots come out and it will take. So what happened was they still had to clean it, make sure no soil and wrap it and put all the names on it. And they ended up, we only could ship 2,500 the first time. And uh, that took three months to get it prepared. But right away it took, and then they wanted another 5,000. And then I think, in the, the next actually three, four, five years, we must have shipped upwards of 15,000 plants to Okinawa. And uh, for these people, they did very well. For the park, it became, they have these carts. You see the bottom slide, it's like a little pineapple on a golf cart. But then you take it through and then they look at the bugs and they became interested because now that place could sell these plants because they, they make cakes or shoots and then you can just do the same thing. And they have a gift shop at the end, and then they can go ahead and, uh, the gift shop also, outside of the gift shop, there's a post office. And the, this place is, the people that go there are usually uh, Jap Japanese tourists. And uh, they have a lot of schools. Uh, school kids go on their school uh, travel retreat, and they would go to different parts of Japan as a, a class. Uh, they even come to Hawaii. Uh, some of the schools. You know, they haven't been there since uh, 2019, but I've, I've talked to groups coming here from Japan, the students, but I, tell, I talk about the history of the first generation coming to Hawaii. That's another side story, but 
At the same token, this place became so popular that this, this pineapple park became a big hit. And uh, uh, anyway, they, they really took off and did very well. So it was just a matter of ch chance. And you can see the plants on the left-hand uh, uh, slide, very colorful. And they put up whole walls and they, these plants, you just stick them on a uh, wall and then it'll cling to the, the wall. So next slide is basically question time. It's already got five more minutes. If anybody has a question, please uh, type it in. Otherwise, uh, you can slide I, put the next slide on. Yeah, here's my yeah. contact on here. If you can, if you need to call me, my cell phone is best. I, I'm a more on the senior citizen side, so. Luckily, I have very good staff people. You can ask the staff people on some of these things, uh, questions you may have. But uh, if you need to reach me, my cell phone is there, and that's the fastest way. If you need, don't leave a message at my office because I forget to pick up the messages. Uh, so if anything, you can ask somebody who's answering the phone to ask me to call them back, and then they'll call me on my cell phone. But you're free to call me on my cell phone too, because there are a lot of other stories that I can pass on and uh, mail service is another thing too. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask, there's a couple questions. I, I, yes. They're difficult to, to answer, but at least you can give us some idea. So many small companies in Hawaii, when they're first exporting, let's say to Japan, they will use this service of USPS. It works. Um, uh, for a certain amount of product, right? This yes. large box is as big as they can do for $110, you can fit in some amount of product up to 20 pounds. And I've seen a lot of people using these uh, medium boxes too. Right. Now, at what point does a company decide uh, okay, we can't continue to do this anymore. Our our orders are too big, or it's just not cost effective. We need a freight forwarder working with us. It's, it's good to uh, touch base with myself. That question is because, let's say, for instance, depending on how much product you can get in these five rate boxes. Okay, this is a very very economical way because don't forget it includes. Pick up the post office can pass and uh, deliver a box for you, or you can go to the post office, any post office, and, and pick up a free box. And then you can even go to the uh, USPS.com site and, and put the labels on. Uh, of course, because of international, you have to put the, the what's in it. Uh, you have to have a, like a packing list, and uh, certain things need more than just uh, that. You need to have a uh, certificate showing what's uh, ingredients like this food stuff and it's going to go commercially. You can't just send cookies. Uh, it'll be stopped and uh, commercial like that. So at a certain point when you have, I would say, if you need to ship 200 pounds, or let's say you have this four boxes of that size of the uh, a large family box, then you might consider doing that. The, uh, the difference is where is it going to be delivered? Uh, if your customer is willing to clear customs, uh, things like that. Uh, well, that that is a big part. I shipped uh, ship shipments to Japan where the delivery cost, the just pick up and delivery. I mean, the customs clearance and delivery was more than double the air freight cost. Like I mentioned, the air freight is uh, inexpensive, but the inland is all regulated, and especially Japan. I took a bunch of candy shippers to Shanghai, and then I set up a meeting with Japan's customs uh, confectionery division to see how we could. This is before we started to ship to uh, China, uh, maybe the chocolate candies. So when we went there after, we, I hired an interpreter and spoke to two people from uh, customs, Japan, uh, China customs, and they told me, you know, you'd be better off to send it to Hong Kong and have it trucked up. I said, no, we don't want to truck. This is too perishable chocolate candy. He said, that's the easiest. I said, when, when you say it's easiest, it's because they don't check it as much if it's coming from Hong Kong. 
and it has to be entered on the phone. I said, so I told the interpreter, ask him, I, do you need for us to smuggle it? And she said, the, the guy said, yeah, it's not like smart. I said, we don't want to do anything illegal. And uh, he said, well, you asked for the cheapest way, but then, so we started to ship chocolate and candy, and unfortunately, unfortunately, this horror story started. The first shipper shipped two container, air containers of about 90, 90 boxes in each container, one going to Shanghai, one going to Beijing. Now, the orders differ as to what type of chocolate. We should have done it. I mean, now in hindsight, we should have sent it on different days, because when he went on the airlines, he went to Tokyo to transfer one to Shanghai, one to Beijing. They put the wrong container on the different flights. And so it was held, he couldn't clear customs. But Shanghai being an, almost like an international destination, they ended up sending it to Hong Kong. I mean, the Hong Kong uh, shipment went to Beijing overnight, really fast. And then uh, of course the airlines pay for all of this. The one in Beijing, nobody could sign off, took one month but we had meanwhile replaced the shipment and sent that uh, order for Shanghai directly. After one month, we finally got to Shanghai uh, at about oh, 10 cases of missing uh, out of that. And I'm not saying that they're not very good. It's just, I guess, during the course of leaving it there, of course, the chocolate was really bad because they didn't keep it under uh, you know, good temperature control, which is another thing. Some airports like the Incheon Airport it takes to drive from the plane side to cargo is about 15 minute drive. It's a long ways. But then it's not only that. The plane lands, they unload all the cargo, they take the bags off, and the bag is goes to uh, the arrival section of customs. The, the cargo sits there, plane side, and then they wait until they start loading the cargo for the flight after that. So it may take a good 30, 45 minutes before it's even taken to the uh, uh, cargo warehouse. And the cargo warehouse has three, or oh, I'm sorry, three, five climatic zones. So you get it put down. It's important to put what temperature you want to be kept at. And we had chocolate candies one. And what happened was it was unacceptable. But this is when they first opened uh, in Chun. So we work with customs there, uh, customs, uh, the cargo company, they bring all the cargo. And they said, you have to alert us by sending a message telling us one that you have perishable, they'll send one tug to pick up just that container. So it's not going to be sitting out for more than 15, 20 minutes and then put down the temperature that you want to get that. So these are all things that you have to learn. And meanwhile, some carriers here have a problem because their contract with the ramp people, they have to pick up cargo two hours prior to the departure. Some planes are not even here. The plane going to Japan is coming in from LA, say, and it's just for uh, once it comes here, maybe hour and a half, two hours, and they take them out too early. So I said that's not acceptable. So we, we make sure that uh, it's not taken out right away, and then it's only taken out when the plane is ready to be loaded, and that's why we eliminate some carriers which they don't follow that rule. And we've had some claims. The airlines don't pay planes, uh, just to let you know. But the contract is between the shipper and, and me. And uh, I have to pay the claim because we didn't do a good job of making sure. So actually we had to sit on those candy shipments to make sure that uh, it doesn't go out. And even the cut flowers or the potted plants that we're shipping, all those things cannot be left sitting out in hot, on the sun. So it's important. So going back to this box, it's very good. Uh, domestically, I had a, one of the viewers uh, of our program, they had a, they shipped uh, pet food, uh, pet, what to call it, uh, pet cookies, doggy cookies, I'm sorry, like doggy cookies. And uh, this company was in Kauai, so she asked me to audit their shipping. They were using the flat rate box. So first off, I, I asked, is that sufficient to get to your customers? And say, I have 21 pet shops throughout the mainland, and uh, I don't have a big production, so I can only make so much and these flat rate box. So I compared them, uh, her stuff with the uh, rate versus FedEx, UPS, small package service. And I said, for each box, you're saving $10 by going to the post office. And as a matter of fact, FedEx, UPS also provide boxes, but their rate's a little higher. I was $10 for 
Uh, mm. So she felt good that, okay, she's doing the right thing. Until such time that her production is increased or her orders get bigger to each destination, then she's going to look at other means. Huh? We're running over time, but... <laughs> Okay, I think um, that's it. I, I'd like to just uh, say uh, thank you again to Brian and our uh, other speaker who was going to join us from Madison to talk about uh, ocean shipping. Um, however, she had an emergency medical issue and we'll get her back at another time. Um, if anyone has a question, for Brian, uh, here's his contact information. I will be sending out this uh, presentation to all of the uh, attendees uh, as well Excuse as- me, there was, There's a question that was asked. Uh, on the, the oh, do we know when the lane to Japan may is open? opening? This morning's paper will show you that uh, uh, they're expecting a big uh, surge of tourism coming in at the end of April, April 29th, the start of Golden Week, and it's gonna be a biggie. So, you know, like I say, uh, we were getting getting a lot more flights coming in, so that might be the start. But I think uh, Jamie had mentioned to me off off camera was that uh, they expect by Ju uh, July, June or July, uh, maybe July, a huge you know influx of Japanese travelers. And the forecast by the uh, Hawaii Tourism say that next year is going to be a banner year for uh, tourism in Hawaii. So with that. The rates can either come down or you know things like that would happen. The more flights you have, the more competitive it gets. The more passengers on the top side pays for the flight coming in. So maybe the, even the fuel might come down. Who knows? Great. Great. But that's it. Yeah. Okay. With that, then I'd like to wrap this up and uh, I'll send out this presentation and a link to the edited video within uh, the next week. Um, so with that, let's see, sorry, one more question. Thanks, Alvin. Uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you to Jamie Lund from DBET. Uh, thanks, of course, to Brian Suzuki from Hawaii Air Cargo. And uh, this is Rob Hack from the Hawaii Pacific Export Council signing off this one, Logistics uh, from Hawaii. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.